spotlight highlighting an innovation and a startup that's working in the hospitality industry. Um, this is Savvy Oak, and I am welcoming Steve Cousins and Dr. Tessa Lau from um, Savvy Oak to the stage. They have an impressive background that you can see in the um, program, but both of them used to be with Willow Garage, which develops robots. Um, they both have been at IBM. They've both been at um, Xerox Park, and so they bring a tremendous background in the robotics field, and they're trying to bring robots into the service industry. So with that, here's this is Relay. Great. Thank you. And it's a challenge to follow Chip, so the best thing I could do is bring a robot. That gives me a chance. Um, I, I wanted to start, though, before I start talking about the robot, I wanted to talk about the, um, uh, where we came from and, and um, what you might uh, call the sort of actualization. You know, what's our focus as a company? Where do we come from? So we're going to organize this talk into sort of three parts. Uh, why are we doing this and kind of the history? I'll tell you a little bit about Relay and what it does, and then Tessa's going to talk about the future, how Relay might be able to help in aging. So this is a guy named, named Henry Evans. Henry is, uh, is now 51 or 52 years old. Uh, when he was 40, he had a brainstem stroke. And Henry, uh, sort of a strange way to start my talk, I guess, but, but Henry um, is a mute quadriplegic. After his stroke, he came out, and he basically was blink once for yes, blink twice for no. He's really, really bright. He's given a TED Talk that got more hits on YouTube than all of the work that we did at Willow Garage over a six-year period. Um, when Henry saw the PR2, which was a robot that we built in our last company at, on CNN, he said, hey, that robot could be my external body. And he called us up and said, can we start a project? We thought that he was going to use it to like, pick things up off the table, because that's what the robot was designed for. That's not what he did. He turned the robot on himself started reaching the hand out toward his head. And he's kind of defenseless. Um, he's controlling it with his eyes. He put the hand right in front of his nose, and then he scratched his itch. And that was the first time in 10 years he had scratched his own itch. And it was just this amazing moment for us. And this realizing that when you build technology, when you build things that you think are going to help you know, maybe uh, make things more efficient in the workplace or whatever, um, you start to realize that the real impact is on how people are going to use that technology and the ability to let people maintain independence, whether they're older. I, I like to say that we're all kind of developing disabilities as we grow older. Um, Henry, unfortunately, got his early. But he's got such a great spirit. He's able to use the robot to drive around um, a, away from where he is to put things in a drawer. One of his um, things he did is he drove it across his home to the kitchen, pulled a towel out, went across the room, uh, back across the house and then used it to wipe his face, right? A basic human dignity, just being able to shave himself, as you saw. Um, being able to shave Charlie, who was our collaborator in Atlanta, from Palo Alto, which is kind of a cool technical trick. Um, and being able to do simple things, like giving out candy to trick to trick-or-treaters. It's amazing. This is good for the kids, too, because it took a long time for him to give each one, and so they took less candy, which is probably better for them. <laughs> um, this is him getting the towel out of the, out of the drawer. So the point is, um, you know, we look at technology, we say, how can it help people? And then we founded Savvy Oak when Willow Garage ended to try to create robots that can help people. Um, the way that we do this, so, so we'll, the PR2 robot that you just saw is a $400,000 robot, which means it's great for Henry. He can use it. Um, not everybody with, who has a quadriplegic is going to get one in their home at $400,000. How do we build a cost-effective robot? And the answer is we keep it simple. Um, this is Relay, and Relay is... Um, much, much simpler than the robot that Henry was using, but it's designed to do one thing very well. So we've decided to focus initially in the hospitality space. And this robot, when you uh, call the front desk and say, hey, could I have a, a toothbrush? I forgot my toothbrush. Or can I have a bottle of water? Or can you send me up a snack? Uh, the front desk agent comes over. They type on the screen. They type in your room number. They put whatever you're asking for inside. And they say, go. Right? And at that point, the lid closes automatically. The robot navigates to your room. How does it get to your room? It drives over to the elevator. It knows where to wait outside the elevator. It calls the elevator. How does it do that? Wi-Fi, or as I like to say, telepathy for robots. Um, and then it, when, it, uh, calls the, when the elevator comes, it gets in. It gets in with people, it rides up to the floor, gets off, goes to your room. When it gets to your door, how does it knock? It doesn't knock. It calls the room, because it can do that over Wi-Fi. Um, and when you open your door, it sees that the door's open, and it opens its lid, and you take out whatever that um, somebody was sent to you. So, and then when you're done, you get to interact with it. And one of the cool things we found is um, interesting things. People don't 
like when the robot just closes its lid and goes away. They want to interact with it more. They want time for a selfie. Um, and, so, and so we extended the interaction. You click and say, I got my stuff. And then it says, well, how's your stay? Right? And then you can give it, uh, if you give it five stars, it does a little happy dance. Woo! It only makes some, um, it only makes whistles and beeps because we don't want to set expectations too high. But, you know, it does that little noise and then um, takes off. And if you give it two stars, we can tell the hotel, hey, this guy's not happy. And it's before you actually went on TripAdvisor and wrote why you're not happy, right? They have a chance to fix the problem. So it's a pretty um, exciting new technology for hotels. Um, what we found is that, and, and when we were at Willow Garage, we actually started building technology to do delivery to people, thinking about how is that going to, um, and I'll just kind of show you, um, we're thinking about how is the, the technology going to help people um, in, in all different cases. And we started in elder care. Um, we decided to focus initially at Savvy Oak on hospitality because it's very close to elder care, but it's kind of organized a little bit more into brands, and um, we, don't, we can have a chance to kind of work out the glitches in the technology, but we're now at a point where we're ready to start trying it. Um, just to, you know, the, again, the model is simple. You put something in it, um, passes people in the hall, um, and just to give you a sense of how it moves, right now Tessa's driving it on, on stage manually because we don't have a map of the stage and if it falls off it's really bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, here's it going completely on its own, just navigating through, actually this is a hotel show, going down the hallway with different vignettes and you can see it kind of interacting with people. Um, it's, again, designed to be very simple and yet smooth and graceful. I have five laws of robotics. They're not Asimov's laws because uh, those kind of words don't apply. But, um, because you can't know like when somebody's going to get in trouble. But the, my laws of robotics are don't hit anybody, don't hit anything, don't get lost, move gracefully, and then ride the elevators when you need to. So <laughs> much more pragmatic. Um, and, and then when it gets to the room, this is it. And people don't get dressed. And people like the robot partly because they don't have to tip it, although people have. Um, <laughs> and, and, and also because they don't have to get dressed for it. And I can tell you that they don't. We have a new protocol where we blur out the video that the robot's taking when it looks into the room because of that. Um, so we've done uh, 3,000 deliveries in live hotels. This has been out for about nine months now. Um, we're in a couple of hotels, and we're starting to expand into more. Um, and uh, yeah, we've done about 450 kilometers. Actually, now with the new fleet of robots, 600 kilometers indoor navigation. So um, let me turn it over to Tessa to talk about what's next. All right, so, um, so that's what we were doing now. What I'm interested in thinking about is what are we going to do next? And we're exploring other adjacent markets besides the hotel industry. So we're looking at hospitality, elder care, and other uh, similar markets. Uh, actually, we have a, an, a grant from the National Science Foundation to study uh, robots for use in elder care. And there's some really interesting things coming out of that grant. The first thing we found is that actually um, in large communities like CCRCs, uh, the basic functionality of this delivery service actually is a really good match for them. Uh, so we're interested in piloting some of those with CCRCs in the near future. But beyond that, right, what can we do to enhance our robots to increase quality of life, to increase people's independence, and give them more capabilities of doing things on their own without requiring human support um, from caregivers or clinicians or other people around them? Um, and so as part of this grant, we had a, a summer student um, come and build some prototypes for us, look at, uh, do some interviews with some elders at different focus groups across the US. And um, we found a couple different uh, use cases that could benefit the elderly. Uh, we're interested in hearing more, so if you have some ideas of how our robot can be used in elder care, we'd love to hear them. Uh, we're looking at trying to branch out and expand into new markets eventually. Uh, some, of these, some of these applications that we found so far um, Delivering water, you know, it's hard to stay hydrated. Uh, so having a robot bring you water a couple times a day or whenever you need it is a really uh, compelling use case. Uh, we also think that there's opportunity to work this into a larger service model. So if you have a robot bringing you water on a regular basis, and then suddenly you start needing more water, you know, and you start needing more water, and you're always asking for water, that might be a good indicator that something's going wrong. Maybe a, someone should check up on you and you know make sure you're doing okay. And so we want to take this robot and turn it into part of a platform for monitoring and improving health over time. So that's where we're going. Right. Thank you. I just, I'll end with questions, and, and uh, that's a robot that's at the Stanford Computer Science Department. Uh, they have a little museum in the lobby, and that's doing almost the same thing, navigating, but from about 40 years ago. Uh, we're trying to make it real.
Awesome. Great job. Thanks. We, we did have a number of questions about, like, are we going to have here a presentation from the robot as well? So it doesn't, doesn't speak. It doesn't speak, yeah. OK. On purpose. Uh, we should probably move on quickly. If there's one burning question for the Savioc team, maybe in the back, if there's a, uh, I think I've got the microphone. You got it. Awesome. It's a simple one. OK. What does that unit cost? So this unit is, um, we're actually doing robot as a service as a model, and it's a couple thousand dollars a month. So you, so you put it in, and, and the, all the maintenance and everything is on us. Robot as a service. That's the phrase we're going to be hearing more and more. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Good job.